Good evening, everyone. We're so glad that you're here. Welcome. Um, welcome to session four of the Creating Supportive Environments for LGBTQI2 plus students and staff in schools. Uh, a lot of us are very familiar with Zoom, but just want to remind you of a few housekeeping items to get us started this evening. Uh, this is our four, session four of our four part series. A few housekeeping items. Uh, we've made we have made every attempt to make today's presentation secure. If for some reason we need to end the presentation unexpectedly, we'll follow up with the, the registration information. You'll be able to unmute and share video. We want this to be an interactive hour together. Um, use the chat to ask questions if you're more comfortable with that. Um, I will send a follow-up email within the next two days with one CEU for each of you who have registered. Uh, be sure that, that it meets the licensing requirements for your credentialing board. Quick overview of who we are. Um, today's webinar is brought to you by the South Southwest Mental Health Technology Transfer Center. This is an initiative funded by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration to provide free training and ongoing consultation to the diverse array of professionals that serve individuals with mental health challenges across our five state region, which you'll see highlighted in purple on this image. Uh, we are housed at the University of Texas, Austin. Uh, the Mental Health Technology Transfer Center, or MHTTC for short, is a project of the Texas Institute for Excellence in Mental Health, as I mentioned, housed at the Steve Hicks School of Social Work in UT Austin. We have a disclaimer for you to just take a look at for just a moment, um, knowing that this presentation was prepared for the South Southwest MHTTC under a cooperative agreement with the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA. And here is our amazing team that works and is a part of the South Southwest MHTTC. Um, appreciate all of this amazing group for helping us to put this project together. I think I can speak for our team when I say we're genuinely humbled to be able to provide this space for this critical workforce, which has faced drastic changes and challenges in supporting and serving our communities this year. Before we introduce our speaker, we need to just set the stage for just a moment. We hope that uh, the space that we have created for the next hour for each of you, use, we hope that we will have affirming, respectful, and recovery-oriented language in all of our activities. The language is strengths-based and hopeful, inclusive and accepting of diverse cultures, genders, perspectives, and experiences, healing-centered, trauma-responsive, inviting to individuals participating in their own journeys, person-first and free of labels, non-judgmental and avoiding assumptions, respectful, clear, and understandable, and consistent with our actions, policies, and products. This is you, Ari. Hey, everyone. This is Ari Acosta, and I'm with Natalie and the MHTTC team. We want to take a moment to um, acknowledge that even though we're attending this event online and we're signing in from different locations all over the region and other parts of the country, um, the South Southwest MHTTC team acknowledges that we are standing in the traditional land of the tribes Alabama, Fushara, Cado, Carrizo, Comecrudo, Coahuiltecan, Comanche, Kikapul, Ipanapache, Puntagua, and Isleta del Sur Pueblo, and all the American Indian and indigenous peoples and communities who have been and have become a part of these lands and territories in Texas. We acknowledge the painful history that has brought us to reside on these lands, and we seek to evaluate the effects on settling colonialism and our participation in that process, searching ways for the healing of intergenerational trauma. We honor the indigenous caretakers of these lands and waters before us, the indigenous peoples today, and the generations to come. Thank you so much, Ari. Um, excited to welcome our amazing panel. Um, as I mentioned before, my name is Natalie Fikach and I serve as a school mental health lead at the South Southwest MHTTC. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I'd like to introduce Shane Wally, pronouns Z, here, and hers. Hello, everyone. I'm so glad to be here tonight uh, for this and a final event in the series. I had the good fortune to also moderate uh, the last panel, so I'm glad to be back. Um, I uh, um, 
own a little company called Daring Dialogues Consulting. I'm an adjunct faculty member in the Steve Hicks School of Social Work at UT Austin. Uh, I'm just finishing up grading. i um, grateful to have an excuse to not be grading, so thank you. Um, and we're going to go around uh, and do a, a set of uh, introductions of the panelists. And just a reminder for folks, uh, name pronouns, where you work. Oh, and then I also have to get, I get to answer this. Uh, what you love about supporting LGBTQ youth, right? So um, for me, I've had the good fortune to both work at AISD, Austin Independent School District, and at Out Youth. Um, and for me, I just, I learn so much from youth all the time, right? They, they know more than we do. We just have to remember that. Um, and so I appreciate their passion and their knowledge and their fierceness and their bravery. So uh, Cassidy, I'm gonna pass it to you. Yeah, thanks Shane. <clears throat> My name's Cassidy. I use they, them pronouns. Uh, I'm a marriage and family therapist and licensed professional counselor in the state of Texas. Uh, I work at Out Youth, which is a, a nonprofit located in Austin for LGBTQ youth. Um, we offer counseling support, social support, support in schools, things like that. Um, and I think the thing that I enjoy most about this work is kind of what Shane said, that uh, it's really humbling and it's really inspiring. And I really feel honored to see how much people can change um, and how they grow. Um, and working in the community I am in is really, really meaningful to me too. Uh, but I will popcorn over to Isaac. Sure, hey everyone. Um, my name is Isaac. I use he, him pronouns. I'm a senior at UT Austin, majoring in government with a minor in LGBTQ plus studies. Um, I'm a member of the Glisten Austin Board of Directors, which is the local chapter of Glisten, um, the Gay, Lesbian, Straight Education Network, a national organization working to eradicate bullying and harassment in K through 12 school districts. Um, I also have experience working in the Texas House um, as a member, as an intern for the Texas House LGBTQ Caucus, where I worked on anti-bullying and harassment legislation, um, and then also have experience working with Equality Texas. And so this work is really important to me because um, I was an a queer youth who experienced bullying and harassment in my own school district. I'm from Arlington, Texas. Um, and I this work is really exciting to me because it allows me to, to make the world a better place for those youth who are coming through the school system now. So um, it's definitely a personal experience and a, a personal passion, and I'm just excited to be here. Thanks. Megan, go ahead. Hi everyone, I'm Megan Butler. I'm the Secondary Counseling Coordinator for Austin ISD Counseling Crisis Mental Health. Um, so we support about 230 school counselors, yay for school counselors. I use she, her, and her as my pronouns. And um, I love working with LGBTQIA2 plus youth. Um, I love to see them grow. I mean, honestly, it's like butterflies, right? They're, they're a cocoon and then we get to see them their beautiful selves emerge and, and walk tall and feel proud and it's amazing work. So I love, I love that part. Robert, I'm gonna let you close. Yeah, thank you and hello everyone. Uh, my name is Robert Salcido, I use he, him pronouns. I'm the Community Outreach and Engagement Manager with Equality Texas. Uh, so we work specifically to advocate on behalf of the LGBTQ plus community um, as well as their families. Um, in addition to my role with Equality Texas, I am the board chair uh, for the past 10 years for Pride Center San Antonio, which is a local LGBTQ community resource center, um, and also work with a, a couple of different organizations when it comes to equity and inclusion. Uh, and so I'm excited to uh, be here with you all. Uh, I initially got into this work, um, or I should say into the nonprofit work and uh, social justice, specifically around LGBTQ um, youth uh, when I uh, finished college and moved to San Antonio. I'm originally from, or I was raised in Northwest Texas in Amarillo. Um, so as y'all could imagine, there's not much in the way of queer life there. Um, and, uh, but I was raised in a family that was very affirming. And I thought that that's how everybody was until I moved to San Antonio and quickly met a lot of people who had been either displaced from their family, uh, disowned, uh, and really just ostracized for who they are. Um, and so that really 
uh, put a, and lit a fire under me and, and has continued my passion for, uh, for many years um, in advocating for not only uh, for folks to be embraced and accepted for who they are, um, but really to be authentic and, and be able to thrive. And so uh, working with youth, um, and as, as Shane mentioned, uh, they oftentimes teach me more than I think I, uh, than I, that I know already, but I, I never, it's never, uh, a learning process never stops. So I'm glad to be here today. Cool, thank you. So um, in panel three, I made the statement, right, that um, the panelists were going to do a majority of the talking and we wouldn't have a lot of time for questions and answers and to please come back for panel four because we really want to make time for things that you are interested and curious in knowing the answers for. I, of course, have a list of questions because I always do, um, but we really are interested to know what you all would love to hear from this amazing knowledge bank of uh, feisty folks that we have on the panel. So um, you can drop them in the chat. I will do my best uh, to, to keep an eye on what is going. Um, and we're gonna start with this question because for me, this question is really about the why, the why we do this work, the why this panel is important. And so um, anybody on the panel who wants to answer this, uh, please feel free. And just a reminder that the question is, what are some of the positive outcomes you have seen when policies, procedures, and practices are implemented that are affirming to youth and staff in schools, right? Um, so uh, whoever wants to go first, I'll just let you take yourself off mute. I'll get us started. Uh, so I, as I mentioned, I've been in this work uh, for quite a bit of time. And uh, I've seen uh, a lot of things that have uh, shifted and changed over the, the years. Um, and however, what I'll, I'll focus on, and it was probably one of the first, what I would consider wins um, in the work that I was uh, specifically uh, doing with a school district or was working with a young student uh, who uh, was advocating to wear a tux uh, to their prom. Um, and come with their girlfriend who was not a, a student of the school. Uh, and it was uh, an opportunity for us not only to educate the, the administrators and uh, those folks that were opposed to this student uh, from wearing a tux because it did not match the gender um, expression that they felt that uh, their, their sex, uh, how they were identified uh, should be. Um, and so working with this student who was just, when I first met, was just very timid and shy and not really wanting to stand up for themselves, but knew that they didn't feel that it was right that the way that they were being treated. Um, and so going through a series of meetings with the, and, and really standing by their side, I didn't necessarily go in and lead the meetings. I was just there as a support system to this young student who was wanting to advocate on their own. Um, and the, the end result of it was that, yes, they were able to wear their prom uh, tux and, and they were able to bring their girlfriend and, uh, and it resulted in some changes to the school district in, in terms of how they looked at things. Um, maybe because we had to strong arm them a little bit, but nonetheless, we got to, to the point where we needed to be. Um, and that is as a result of really showing them where does their legal boundaries stand in terms of what is the legal things that they can stand on. Um, and then also showing the school district on what policies that they need to update in order to really be compliant with the law, um, but also just to be good people. Um, and, you know, so that, that was a, a great result of it. Um, but the best result of it was seeing this young individual blossom um, and seeing that they were able to advocate for themselves and, and without, you know, indirectly advocating for their other students that also wanted to wear um, different clothes to express themselves. Um, and so really that was like the, the, the golden topping for me was just to see how much within a, a, a couple of months that this, this youth blossomed. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I've actually run into them a couple of times since. Um, they've now since graduated from college and uh, and are, are thriving. So it's just it's it's a beautiful thing to see uh, when you have one advocacy 
attached to policy and seeing how they work hand in hand with one another to make sure that the, that the policies um, are being followed or that they're being corrected to make sure that they are um, how they should be. I can speak to some positive mental health outcomes um, that I see in folks uh, when we're able to affirm at not only like a personal level, but a systemic level, right? So um, what we tend to see in clients uh, is a decrease, right? In depression, anxiety, a decrease in suicidality, suicide attempts, a decrease in self-harm, um, a decrease in ideation, um, and an increase in ability to participate in school, right? And an increase in attendance. Um, I think a lot of folks wonder, you know, if we give space to this gender identity or otherwise um, sexuality, then will this be distracting in this space? And the answer is that the noise of the difficulty of navigating the systems, that is the distracting thing. And so once we can kind of decrease some of that noise, um, we can see a huge, huge change in folks' mental health and, and ability to um, be with you and learn with you. And I think, you know, you folks who are teachers and administrators, I think you will feel it for yourselves too. So um, yeah, I would say that's the positive outcome that I've seen uh, over the last six years uh, for folks in school. I've seen um, in my work as a school counselor and a school teacher, and um, now as a district level administrator, I've seen entire schools change. Um, and so it does oftentimes take one or two brave students to be the first, right? To say, I'm the first, whatever, to be out, right? And then it's, you know, then we all learn, and then the adults learn, and then we catch up with the kids. Um, and so I think what I've seen is more safety. That's like the key with me. And that's the key whenever I'm having conversations with other folks, if there is pushback or anything, um, it's safety, right? Safety first. And if kids feel safe, then they're able to actually learn. They can access their prefrontal cortex and learn. And if they don't feel safe, they can't learn. And so we can all agree on safety. Um, and having students say, I actually want to come to school, I'll actually come early, I want to be in a club, I want to stay late, <laughs> they're engaged because they feel safe. Um, so that's, that's the outcome that's always most important to me. I just want to affirm everything that those, the panelists said. I, I think I agree with all of that. Um, and I also just want to take this question and kind of look at it at the macro level, at the state level. Um, I think um, you know, Megan was talking about the power of visibility and just having those conversations around changing policies. Um, and even those conversations can spark really transformative change. So just this past session, you know, we had 70 plus anti LGBTQ plus legislation introduced in the state of Texas, but there was one positive and, and that is House Bill 4064, which would be the first statewide anti-bullying and harassment policy introduced that protects um, students on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. And so this is the first year that this bill was introduced and it actually got a hearing in the public education committee. So like even just having those conversations in you know, the legislature normalizes and legitimizes these discussions and paves the way for future progress on this issue, even if it isn't tangible in the meantime. So I think that same lesson can apply to specific schools, specific school districts that are trying to start having conversations around these issues. I think just normalizing it is definitely the first step and can lead to all these beneficial outcomes that um, the rest of the panelists have discussed today. Thank you. Uh, Robert, do you want to speak any more to the question in the uh, the terrible thing that's happened? Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. So the, the question was asked in regards to school districts that are blocking the websites from, or for blocking their uh, networks from being able to access websites that are uh, LGBTQ plus uh, resources. Um, and so they're, they're blocking them with the auspice that they are uh, nudity or they're sexually vulgar or these other, you know, things that, yeah, you should definitely block a website for those reasons. Um, but the fact is, is that these websites are actually, uh, you know, websites that would help with resources uh, for these students um, that are either looking uh, to help come out or to help with their identity um, and, and amongst other, you know, things that they can do. 
Um, this is not something that's new. Um, I'm not sure exactly where Jennifer that posed the question is. I'm assuming in the, the Dallas-Fort Worth area, perhaps, since it's the uh, Dallas voice was blocked, but um, it's happening in Katy, Texas right now. It's, hap it's happened in Tennessee. It's happened in many other states across uh, the country. Um, ACLU actually has a website that is dedicated to uh, censorship uh, of, or the filters um, for that. Um, there's been lawsuits um, on it. And so um, definitely it's something that's happening. Um, we saw it uh, more so when the uh, list of over 500 books um, in the libraries that was released and then all of a sudden we had things that were dropping off websites and people weren't able to access um, these types of resources. Um, you know, so I would certainly recommend uh, checking out the ACLU website. Uh, like I said, there's uh, lawsuits that have been filed. So there's certainly things that can be done uh, because again, this, uh, you know, in, in my opinion, not being a lawyer, but violates uh, people's uh, rights, uh, particularly when we talk about their First Amendment rights um, or, uh, and, and looking at some of these other things. So it's something that is unfortunately, I think, populating a little bit more throughout Texas right now, um, but it's certainly not new. Um, and so I would definitely uh, look a little bit further into that. Um, you know, just doing a quick Google search, you, you'll find uh, a lot of other stories and whatnot um, of, of, of this happening um, as early as, you know, 2000 uh, and, you know, uh, up until, you know, 2020 and 2021 for sure. I would also say that if people are wondering one of the reasons why it's so important, a lot of times our students can't access these things at home because home is not a safe place for them to look them up and school is. So if we're denying them access to being able to look at them at school, then we're denying them access to ever being able to see them. And that is a problem. So um, just if you're looking for the hundredth argument for why it's bad, uh, <laughs> that would be one. So. Um, okay, I'm going to take a question off the list while I'm waiting for questions to come into the chat. Um, so Cassidy, this one's coming to you. What is your favorite story? And it's very tied to what we're talking about, right? Um, uh, what is your favorite strategy or strategies for overcoming pushback, right? Um, like we can't use people's chosen names um or we can't honor people's pronouns or we can't start a gsa we can't 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 how, what's the how do we help people navigate the long list of can'ts that come our way yeah i think the first thing for i want to encourage everyone to remember is that you are not alone in navigating this and so if you run into pushback my favorite thing is to find someone to consult with get a friend get some support um, so that you can navigate that together. Um, that could be, you know, reading through your districts, your schools, uh, discrimination policy and seeing actually some of this might violate that. I have some power behind me and you have power behind you because you're here, right? And um, you're in the system of folks who want to move things forward. So you always have that power with you. I think it feels like it can be insurmountable um, and I want to remind you that it's not. And even when that work feels like it's at its worst, it is still very powerful. So don't count yourself out. Um, you're a huge agent of change. Um, second favorite is humor. Being funny disarms folks. Uh, I think using humor as much as you can is a really good thing for, for you and for everyone else. Um, as far as like emotional and mental time you can put towards navigating pushback, right? Um, you have to ask yourself, do I have time for this? And sometimes that answer is no. And that's part of the work. Sometimes we have to take a step back and take care of ourselves. And I wanna encourage you to do that um, so that you can stay in it. Um, I'm thinking that uh, there are levels, different levels of pushback, right? Uh, I'm gonna, I guess, maybe to help folks ask questions. If y'all have questions, there's pushback from folks who are higher up than us in administration, from parents, maybe from other teachers, uh, administrators, school counselors. Um, and my general rule of thumb is to think of, you know, if you're trying to navigate something with a student, for example, um, I would encourage adults to talk to adults, right? I, you don't wanna put a student in a one down power situation where advocating for themselves 
is threatening or too scary, right? You know, there's a reason why us as adults maybe feel like it's hard to navigate and advocate for ourselves to administration. It's the same feeling. So adults talk to adults, student level. Um, think about like, maybe does this fall under harm to self or others, right? Is this harmful to the student? Um, is this harmful to, to others in the room? Where is their harm? How can I offer support? Uh, let's see, it looks like there's a, a question about homophobic or transphobic slurs. Yeah, that's a good question. So checking in around language, you know, it depends on um, one, how familiar with that language you are, how comfortable you are correcting it. Um, different kinds of slurs get, uh, you know, ownership taken back by the queer and trans community. So sometimes, um, those could be um, familiar or comforting words that we identify as slurs, right? A really common example is uh, the word queer, right? The word queer, long time ago, slur, right? Now it's, it's in the acronym, right? It's, it's an important word. So asking, you know, the students who are saying the words that sound like slurs to you, get a little information, see where they're coming from. Y'all are teachers, you're there with your students. Y'all administrators, you're there with your students, right? You probably know their tone, so you might be able to quickly tell if it is not coming from, right, that positive space. So um, saying, well, actually, you know, this word is harmful, um, or actually, uh, we need to not use this word. We don't know who's in the room, X, Y, Z. Just think of how you would navigate any other kind of slur, right? How you would stop that. If, if it was a slur towards yourself, what would you say? Um, how would you correct that and protect everybody in the room or help them stay safe in that learning environment? Um, I hope that answers that question. Um, Can I add to that if you don't mind? Yes. Yeah, and just you know, the one thing that and we we it's come up several times, and I think also everything Cassidy said, I definitely agree with them. Uh, but also coming from it from a, a, a lens of them not knowing, so educating somebody about why. And the, the, the example that I always give people, and I always put it down, especially when we're talking to youth, is I'm like, how many of you have ever been playing a video game and your player dies and you say, that's so gay? So then what I have them do is break it down. What, what, are you, what, what do you mean by that? What, what are you actually saying? And trying to do it on their level where it's not necessarily putting them in a position of like to be defensive. I'd be like, like, educate me. What do you mean by that? And then, then of course, break down that, that knowledge for them and educate them on how it, it is offensive. Um, you know, and I think that's, you know, one of the ways it has always worked with me, especially working with you is trying to bring it down to third level. Like let's talk eye to eye on this and, and, and really let them see it. Because for somebody that is playing video games that that's so gay, they may not even realize at all that that, that has any, any homophobic, uh, you know, language to it. And so talking to them on that level, um, I think certainly will help in, in any situation. And I think there's a lot of words that come up in, in that kind of same scenario where we could use that um, as a way to, to educate folks. Any other additions to the how we lovingly uh, correct, redirect, and educate folks on slurs. We encourage our our staff and our and our students to just um, correct it every time. Really, just every time. Say even if it's a short thing, you don't have to go on this whole diatribe. It can just be like, "Hey, choose a different word." Hey, you know, that word's not used to describe, um, you know, or to make fun of people. Please don't use that word to make fun of people. Um, just redirect and, and keep moving on, um, you know, and if they need the explanation, then then great. But because so often it's happening constantly in the hallways, just everywhere all the time, um, you may want to have like a general lesson about we don't use this word at school and make sure that that's clear um, and set that that proactive teaching and then follow up with the redirect. Like we don't use that word to make fun of others. Thank you for your help with that. Just, you know, redirect. <laughs> I think I want to add on to that and then speak to, I think, Daniela's question. Um, but when you're redirecting folks, you know, especially younger folks, a lot of language that's learned is coming from the home. And so 
maybe they just don't know. Um, and that's very much okay. And that's part of that teaching, right? So be gentle uh, as much as you can um, in that process that welcomes more change than not. And I'm sure y'all know that very well. Um, and so advocating as a counselor, as someone who's external to the situation, um, there's a few things you can do um, as far as talking to the student, making sure that student is supported, um, exploring their support system. And if they don't have one, helping them build one, start to build one. Um, you as a professional can use your professional power in that moment. So um, you can write something that is, this is a, a very old term, but it's called a carry letter. Um, and it is what counselors wrote for trans folks way back in the day to advocate for them to be called their name and their pronoun. Um, so a typical carry letter says, hey, the following things are harmful. Um, I ask that you do these things. Here's my license. Uh, my license is a really big deal. You know, it's like a very strongly worded letter um, asking folks to, to follow. Um, I've written a few for, for students in schools um, and they tend to help. Uh, I think just knowing that other adults are supporting this young person, um, that's a way to use your professional power as a licensed person or an, another adult in the space, um, even if you're external to that particular organization. Any other additions to these, the kind of questions that we have live at the moment? Okay, I'm getting out my magic old school clipboard uh, and then hoping I can read the two tiny prints. So one moment. Um, okay, so this is a kind of specific policy and procedure and Megan and Robert, it is going to you, right? Uh, what are policies and procedures uh, for schools to have to show support, right? Um, and right, there are a long list of things. So maybe pick your top favorite three and maybe a couple of tips for how to uh, help either your school and hopefully your district, right? Because I think, I know one of the things that's happening right now in, uh, is that people, students are having to pick which school within their district to go to that's friendliest, right? Instead of making sure that the whole district is good to go. Uh, definitely, I think that's a, a great question. And I think one of the things that we need to also look at is that we currently do not have any uniform policies or laws um, for the most part that protect students um, and staff for that matter. Um, across the state. And so what we see is that there are some districts that are fairly good with their policies. And then there's some districts that have a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, I think if we're looking at policies that um, would uh, be beneficial for school districts to take a look at, um, first and foremost would be a, an anti-discrimination policy. Uh, or a non-discrimination policy that protects, again, both students as well as staff members uh, from uh, issues of discrimination as it pertains to their sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression. Um, I think it's important that they are enumerated, um, that these policies specifically list out the protected classes um, and not just say all students and all staff should be protected. No, we need to be very specific about what we're talking about here. Um, and so uh, when it comes to, to those types of policies, again, both from the student as well as the staff level, um, and that would protect the students as it, um, as it comes across for not only their studies, but extracurricular activities and um, off-campus off events and uh, school sanctioned events, things like that. Um, and then also looking at from the, the staff uh, and not only teachers, but all staff members, all faculty, uh, when it comes to employment um, and then also in terms of the staff members supporting their students as well. We're seeing a lot of that across the state where a uh, student or I'm sorry, where, where staff members are being punished um, or being threatened with punishment because they're simply uh, embracing and uh, acknowledging and affirming um, their students as a safe space. Um, you know, we've saw, we've seen where teachers were, that were showing affirming movies um, that were educational in nature uh, be uh, punished. Uh, we saw where teachers were required 
to remove their safe space stickers from uh, throughout the school. Uh, we saw where a teacher was, uh, you know, suspended from school because they simply showed a picture of their spouse uh, who happened to be the same gender. Um, and so uh, that's why it's important that we have it from both the student and the staff level. Um, another policy I think that is uh, important for us to uh, look at um, is anti-bullying policies. Um, again, enumerating, specifically stating that bullying is forbidden when it comes to sexual orientation and gender identity and expression. Um, and again, that's both for the staff as well as the students. Um, so we need to have uh, that in place. These are not policies or procedures that are uniform across the state. Um, you know, there, there are uh, agencies uh, throughout Texas that, you know, have recommendations or have uh, best practices, but it's, it's up to the individual school districts and sometimes up to the individual schools uh, for what they have in place um, for these types of procedures. Um, and so uh, those are some good things uh, to be, uh, to look out for. Um, and then when we talk about other types of policies and procedures, uh, you know, more recently that you've all probably heard um, is the passing of the anti-trans sports bill um, that does not allow a person to participate on a sports team uh, of the gender that matches um, how they identify um, and requiring them to use their original birth certificate um, and, and uh, you know, there's issues there when it comes to birth certificate as well. Um, of how they were identified at birth um, and the sex they were assigned at birth. Um, but the, even with that, there are no specific UIL roles um, in, in the Interscholastic uh, League that runs uh, these sanctioned sports and choir and these other types of um, events that happen on school. Um, and then also looking at the actual uh, sports programs themselves. Uh, the, the law that was passed here in Texas, and it's still being uh, looked into and kind of picked apart, um, but there's no enforcement mechanisms to it. Like there are, it's, it's flawed. Um, it's it's in, in many people's opinion, um, and hopefully it, it'll come across in the courts that it's unconstitutional um, and will be uh, removed. But uh, that's something that we have to still go through the legal channels uh, and, and uh, great groups like ACLU of Texas and uh, Lambda Legal and, and other groups that are, you know, looking at their uh, opportunities to, to fight against those. Um, but those are the, the, you know, kind of three main policies. And, you know, we can even expand on the sports ban bill um, to look what they were trying to pass in 2015, 2017 of uh, the bathroom bills. You know, they uh, were trying to target trans youth again, um, specifically trans girls. Um, you know, somehow trans men and trans boys um, are kind of not in the picture um, with these because they uh, are using uh, fear tactics um, of protecting women and kids um, or women and girls. Um, and so looking at these types of things that they're using to weaponize uh, gender identity, um, again, uh, in these particular cases, uh, mostly and mainly um, are trans youth uh, girls. Um, and so looking at policies of how that can be done, um, I think ultimately looking at it from like again, as Isaac was saying earlier, from like a macro level or on a state level of like, we need uniform policies across the board um, that are gonna protect our youth. Um, and it, where people in different districts can't cherry pick what they want to enforce or what they want to interpret the way that they interpret it. Um, you know, and oftentimes it's, it's not interpreted in a correct way. Um, it's interpreted to benefit them how they, they choose to see it. Um, and so having these policies that are uniform across the state uh, would certainly help us, um, you know, and that's, you know, looking at it from like a state level. I and mean, if we want to go one step further, um, having these as uniform policies that are on a federal level that would protect everybody, no matter where they are in the United States, um, would certainly be the best um, uh, outcome uh, when we come to those types of policies. But those are the three that I would highlight, um, you know, for us. They can bring us down to the district level and all the beauty that can happen. Awesome. So in Austin ISD, we've come a long way. It has taken um, about 15, 20 years to get to the place where we are today. So it did, does not happen overnight. Um, there's a lot of challenges that we have faced along the way, a lot of protests, a lot of pain and heartache, um, and a lot of folks that gave up a lot of time to get the policies. So just know that we, you know, I can share some, some points of pride from us, but know that it, it took a long way to get here. Um, so in addition to having that enumerated policy that specifically names 
um, you know, gender, gender expression, um, gender identity, all of those things, sexual orientation. We also then reinforce the policy. So we have it printed. We post the policy around the non-discrimination policy. During Pride Week, we have a lesson that's about the non-discrimination policy. We have required lessons to show students the policy and then tell them how to report bullying if the policy is being violated. So all of that's required on our secondary campuses. So it's, it's good to have the policy. It's really great, though, to let everyone know about it. When we have these you know, lessons on, this is our policy, students are shocked. They're like, what? That's not allowed? That's been happening to me. You know, and so we get a lot of bullying reporting, and that's, that's what we want. We want people to report it so that it can change. Um, and yes, put the policy into practice, Shane, yes. Um, the other kind of piece is we started looking at um, names, right? So there's a name change policy that we have in Austin ISD, where if a student goes by another name than the name that they were assigned at birth, um, they can go by that name, right? And so we want to encourage that students to go by the name they feel comfortable using. And so um, I'll put that in the chat. But um, we, we share this with counselors and with parents um, at back to school events. And we say, hey, if your student goes by another name, let us know. This helps all students, honestly. Some students go by their middle name and they feel more comfortable with a nickname. Um, so it, you know, some of these policies that help our LGBTQIA2 plus kids actually can help all kids. Early release, early release. And um, so I'll put that in the chat. The other kind of piece is in general, just like a general rule, we just try not to gender things. Just don't gender things that don't need to be gendered. So for example, if you have a choir class, you don't need to have a boys choir and a girls choir. You can just have choir. And you can have an alto soprano choir and you can have a bass tenor choir and whoever wants to go to those choirs can be there. Um, but you don't have to separate things by gender. When you're lining students up for, for lunch in the elementary school, you don't need to do a boy girl line. You can just say, birthdays January through May in this line, right? So you, there's different ways and those kind of techniques we work with our teachers to try to create those spaces so kids feel included. Um, we've also really encouraged our um, gender and sexuality alliances on campus. It's really important for our students to know that they have support and they have support behind them. Now, some of our campuses were getting some pushback, right? They were like, oh, we don't want to have an LGBTQ club. So some of them call it a no place for hate club. Some of them call it a diversity club. And then they just let all the kids know this is where you go for support, right? So we're finding ways to make sure people feel included and supported. Um, and that's, you know, we have these clubs at elementary schools all the way through secondary. Um, and, and they just work on anti-bullying, you know, policy, you know, dissemination and, you know, fun, fun activities, connecting, um, you know, making rainbow jewelry, all kinds of stuff. So I would say creating those spaces is really important. That's really encouraged. We encourage all our school counselors to co-sponsor those clubs. Um, because I'm in the counseling realm, we really worked with counselors on being able to be prepared for if a child comes out to you, how do you support them? So we do training on that. Um, and then we always remind them of our ethical standards, right? So our counseling ethical guidelines say, our job is to remove barriers to learning. Our job is to advocate for LGBTQ kids. So we remind them that, right? Um, every child deserves to have a safe school counselor at their campus, and that's part of our ethical guidelines. Um, so it's just a couple things I'm thinking off the top of my head, Shane, did I miss anything? You want to talk a little bit about uh, how people can navigate pronouns? I think that's the other right big thing that gets uh, neglected. Yeah, and so what we will do is we, you know, we start with a student. So, you know, our, our thing in Austin IC is the student voice. So we'll ask the student, how do you want to be identified in my counseling office versus in gym class versus in your theater class? Where you know, like, tell me what works for you. Um, I love Cassidy earlier. Um, they were talking about, you know, the adult to adult. Um, we have a lot of those conversations, right? And so find the person that's, that's able to explain that to the adult and say, hey, we really need you to be on board with using these pronouns. And um, I even say, you don't have to get it. You just have to do it because it's going to help with student safety. And if our student doesn't feel safe, they, they don't learn. So we have the same goal. We want our students to learn. Um, in order for them to learn they have to feel safe, this pronoun helps them feel safe. Um, so thanks for your help with that. You know, we just say it's required. Um, 
and you don't have to understand it and I hope you do someday but you know in the meantime use your pronouns um so does that kind of explain it Shane yeah I think there's just this place about people I have heard <laughs> all right there's a fear of asking people what pronouns they use right in spaces because we're afraid it outs people or we're afraid that it encourages people to change their pronouns instead of acknowledging that if I can't be my authentic self in a space, right, I don't want to be in that space. Mm -hmm. So just changing the culture of a culture of asking and sharing pronouns in a way that really kind of normalizes it as part of being as equally of important as our name, mm -hmm. I think is just super important. Yep. I and so we'll post it on our emails too just she her just just normalize hey there's different pronouns and it's good to know what it is right yeah i was gonna say that megan that there's there's other ways for us yes there's there's policy policy is always great putting that into practice is, is definitely needed um but also modeling it in your our classrooms or as you know as professionals of when you introduce yourself even if you use the pronouns that people may assume that you use state them. My name is Robert and I use he, him pronouns. Let's go around and introduce ourselves. And, and even if that person or somebody is not comfortable with using their pronouns or maybe don't even know what pronouns are, you're probably going to get two, one of two things. Somebody's going to ask you, you said he, him, like, what do you mean by that? And so he gives you an, a, a, a teaching moment. Um, but also too, if there's a student in there that knows full well of what pronouns and they may use different ones, that may that would indicate to them and it may allow them to open up and say, hey, my name is whatever. And I use these pronouns, um, which may be different than what we would have assumed. Um, and, and we should never make assumptions, but of what we assume based on 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 that student. And so and even if they may not come right out and, and identify the pronouns that they really want to use, it indicates to them that you're a safe space that you are an inclusive person that they may be able to come to late at a later time when they are ready uh, to talk about the different pronouns they use or the different name that they want to go by or the different gender that they identify with. Um, and so just modeling that behavior as well, I think is really well, like Shane was, say, uh, was saying is, you know, let's normalize uh, giving our pronouns and sharing them as well. And I, I love that, Robert, because sometimes if you can't get all the teachers to do it, start with what you've got, right? So some schools, you may only have one or two teachers that do this. Fantastic. We love our pride stickers, right? And we tell teachers, if you're a safe, supportive ally, and, and we actually have a course on what does it mean to be a safe and supportive ally, but, you know, put your sticker, show students that, that you're supportive. And if I'm in a district where maybe, you know, this is too far, I might have a sticker that just says you are loved and has a rainbow on it, right? How can I send a signal to a child that I'm safe, right? Visible support. I was just going to um, provide some time. Oh, sorry. sorry. Go ahead, Isaac. And then Cassidy also has something to say. Yeah, I was just going to add that. So I'm a senior at UT Austin. Just to put things in perspective, um, I had not um, even heard of the word pronouns, like I and the concept of introducing yourself with pronouns until I came to UT and came to Austin. And I'm from Arlington. It's a pretty sizable, you know, there's half a million people in Arlington. It's a pretty big school district. Um, and so I think we've made a lot of progress over these past few years um, around using pronouns, around respecting gender identity. And so um, I think just making sure that, you know, students are introduced to these topics as early as possible. Um, and that is, it's continually solidified as they are you know going throughout their educational journey is really important and that they don't just learn about these concepts um, when they get to college or even if, if they end up going to college at all so just just for some context all you cassidy thanks yeah i want to speak to some pronouns uh, or information about pronouns and i think tiffany's question is a really good one so i would also like to try to answer that but um so our gender system, our system of understanding sexuality, our language system is bad. We did a bad job, um, but we don't have to keep doing a bad job. And just because you don't know something or something's unfamiliar doesn't make you a bad person. It doesn't make you a bad ally, um, but continuing to learn, that's what improves. That's what changes things, right? So if you run into something that feels, uh, the word I like is crunchy, right? It feels crunchy, it feels weird. And it's okay because you didn't learn it. Right. If I spent 30 years understanding language in this one way, it's going to take me a little bit of time to change that. 
um, and that's not your fault. The system did you real dirty. Um, so again, I wanna encourage you to seek support around that. Um, and speaking to Robert's point around pronouns, um, if I don't feel comfortable asking, and maybe again, that's a power situation, right? If I, an adult, am asking a young person who maybe doesn't want to disclose that, um, I might be putting undue pressure on them. They might not be ready. They might not know. Um, so starting with, hi, I'm Cassidy. I use they pronouns. That's a soft opening. That's a soft signal, um, which is something Megan was speaking to with like stickers and things like that. How can I send soft signals? Um, and also getting used to introducing myself with my pronouns. That's a way to quickly understand what I'm asking someone else to do. Um, what does this feel like to do, right? Um, so things like that, I think will help with pronouns, getting used to it, normalizing it. We don't have to put a spotlight on it, just make it normal. Um, and I think you'll find probably a bit more comfort with it. And especially with pronouns that maybe you haven't heard of or don't understand, um, you know, we might find ourselves saying, well, that's not a word, or I've never heard of that word. And the thing about words is that they were all made up before we decided they weren't. So it's okay to lean into something you don't understand. Um, folks are really, really creative. And it's okay to be gentle with yourself while you're learning um, because learning takes a little bit of time. And so in applying pronouns, if you mess up, figure out how you're gonna gently move on. You know, we don't need to um, sit there and apologize and call a spotlight onto our student and onto ourselves. We can just say, oh, they, or oh, he, and keep going. And if, you know, you feel like it, pull that student, that adult aside, um, privately and say, hey, I'm sorry, I'm working on it. Um, but the attempt means a lot. It means a lot more than, than you think, even if you, you mess up and you will, and that's okay. Um, and so soft signals, right? We have soft positive signals when we see soft negative signals, things that are a bit innocuous, things that people say or do that we know is um, right, anti-queer, anti-trans. How can we manage that. And so I think thinking of how to respond, how to call something out, um, you know, that second trick around pushback, right? Use a bit of humor. So, you know, if folks tend to say words that, you know, it's like a little tricky or they're suggesting that maybe they don't really believe in, in transness or don't believe in queerness, um, it's okay to try to question identity outside of that, right? Um, talk to me about what, what it's like for you to be straight. Talk to me about what it's like to be cis. Um, that's pretty direct, right? Or thinking of um, something I usually tell adults is that um, if I'm asking a question or saying something to a young person or to someone who doesn't share an identity with me, can I answer that same question myself? And if I can't, it's not an appropriate question. Um, so giving people tools like that. And also when you hear those soft signals, maybe it's also a moment to op, op, uh, offer support, offer a learning, um, uh, a learning resource, right? This is a signal that they need some support in their learning and they're so lucky that you're there for them. Um, so what are you gonna offer them? Like, hey, I notice you keep saying X, Y, Z. Um, I have this really great book. I have this really great website. Um, here's this person, go talk to them. Um, I think your students will respond to you better. Things like that. So, uh, oh yes, thank you, Shane, sorry. Um, so cis is short for cisgender. It's not a slur, it's not a bad word. It's just a word. Um, <clears throat> that means the gender you were assigned at birth matches the gender you identify uh, with right now. Um, yeah, thanks, Tiffany. I think, I think that's all I have now. I am going to uh, just do a time check. We have five minutes left. Uh, I know it's the fastest hour ever. Um, I so appreciate all of the input and uh, conversation. Um, I, Ari, I'm just going to check. I think we've been good on the chat. I just want to make sure that there's nothing that we have missed. Yes, we've been very good. Great, yay. Um, so I would love to maybe close, uh, Isaac, I'm sorry, we're not gonna get to your last question. Um, I, I wanna, I've been asking uh, my students this question. So uh, what is a change that you are seeing that makes you hopeful? 
And what do you think has made that change possible? And anybody, I know they didn't, they didn't know this question was coming. So if you're seeing like looks of despair, uh, so what is something that you've seen that makes you hopeful? And what do you think is making that possible? I would go with queer representation or LGBTQ plus rep representation, whether it's in media, um, but more so just in everyday life, seeing teachers that identify as queer, seeing staff members in your school that identify as such, um, that are living outside the box um, and or, or the proverbial box that people put there for some reason. But uh, that, that it makes me hopeful because when I was a youth, many moons ago, that was not the case. And to see it now, especially when I visit schools and when I visit spaces where youth um, are, um, it, it always makes me hopeful and makes me smile. I will say, um, I think kind of building off of our discussion around school districts and school district policy, um, I think it's very easy to get in the negatives and understand that so many school districts lack these really critical policies. but looking at Texas in the national context. So there's two states, I think it's South Dakota and Missouri, whose state legislatures have prohibited school districts from even enacting anti-bullying and harassment policy or non-discrimination policies in their school district. And Texas is not one of those states, right? So we have the freedom and we have the ability to advocate on behalf of ourselves in these local education agencies. And so by you know building on that progress, I think most urban areas in Texas, I know like DFW, at least Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin, San Antonio, Houston, um, have policies that um, are becoming more and more inclusive every year of students who, students and staff who are LGBTQIA+. And so I think those small wins at the district level, at the school level are really important to recognize um, and celebrate, even if there's no transformational change at the national or state level all the time. I think one thing that brings me hope is um, common ground. So um, I grew up in a, a really strong religious tradition and, and you know I value that and I know a lot of folks don't um, don't always understand our LGBTQIA2 plus community but I've found that when we find a common ground and we can say what really matters in schools safety matters every child deserves to feel safe every child deserves to feel safe when we can both agree on that and then we can put things in place to help every child feel safe and when folks can find that common ground that gives me hope um, i know that i'm not going to change everyone's belief systems and not everyone's going to we're not going to share the same beliefs but if we can both agree that every child deserves to feel safe then that's a starting place Um, I think my answer to this has to be kind of a clinical one, of course, and I already said this in the beginning, but uh, to be more specific, I work a lot with primary caregivers of trans youth who are not accepting. Um, that's the main like group of folks that I work with. And so the thing that I see that keeps me really hopeful is the changes that they make that opens up their child's world. Um, you know, you can kind of see this life cycle of someone who I would clinically diagnosed as a butthead and go into like being this huge, amazing advocate. Um, so it just reminds me not to count folks out or discount folks in their learning. Um, learning's lifelong and those changes are huge when they happen. And I'm really, really excited when I see them and they definitely keep me hopeful. So. Uh, when Snickers shows up, it means that we're almost out of time. That's, she's the great uh, piece of that. I would say that one of the things that makes me really hopeful is having over 50 people at five o'clock uh, on whatever day of the week this is, I've lost track, uh, Tuesday, um, show up and ask great questions and stay present and be in this conversation because I think um, building community and building, uh, building support and building knowledge is what is gonna make change happen. So uh, thank you all very much. Uh, loving note to the panelists, if you all can stay.